All rise, we will obey. Good afternoon. We resume now hearing Mr. Mladic's appeal. Council for Mr. Mladic, you have the floor. Please be seated. If I may begin, Your Honors, I will now address and highlight portions of ground five of our appeal as they relate to the alleged forceful transfer and genocide convictions in counts two through eight. I wish to start with the conviction for forceful transfer, which was reached in error and by a disregard of evidence on the part of the trial chamber. Let me try to simplify it for you. As to forcible transfer, the trial chamber selectively relied upon evidence, including Dutch Battalion Officer Franken, only when it supported its erroneous conclusion, but disregarded Franken and his evidence that the forcible transfer was a humanitarian evacuation ordered, indeed organized, at the highest levels of the United Nations, and that the United Nations asked Mr. Mladic to assist with this humanitarian evacuation. This is an appeal paragraph 576, judgment paragraph 2474 to 2478, 2480-2559. In these paragraphs alone, Franken is selectively cited out of context no fewer than 61 times. A close second is insider witness Momir Nikolic, referred to 35 times in these same paragraphs, who, by the way, is identified by the Dutch bat and other witnesses as the main instigator of abuses relating to the buses, not Mr. Mladic. The trial chamber also relied on other even lower level Dutch battalion officers who may not have known of the evacuation agreement that the United Nations presented to Mr. Mladic at his first meeting with Colonel Karamans. To try to buttress Franken and support the judgment, the prosecution in its response at paragraph 224 recalls that the trial chamber also relied upon the evidence of Elko Kuster an even lower level subordinate who had a direct encounter with General Mladic. Relying on Mr. Kuster's testimony, but not on the video of their encounter. And that's at judgment page, paragraph 5188. Allow me to show you how grave this error is. The entire exchange is video recorded. And as we have stated, look to our reply at paragraph 88, Mr. Kuster has mem memorized events according to an incorrect contemporaneous interpretation he received on the ground that was not corrected until many years later by the translation services of the ICTY after review of this video that we're now going to look at. So if everyone's ready, I would like to play the video. Awaiting confirmation.
Okay, here's the video. Move away from here. This says that uh, all, of the, all of the people, they will get the process, all these uh, things they're doing by this order, to that Anyone who wishes to be transported will be transported, be the person small, big, old, or young. Don't be afraid. Slowly, slowly let the women and the children go first. 30 buses will arrive and will transport you towards Kladan. From here, you will pass on to the territory controlled by Alia's forces. Just don't panic. Let the children and the women go first. Be careful not to lose a child. Don't be afraid. Nobody will harm you. May you live long. So now your honors have seen yourselves that the Serbian words uttered by Mr. Mladic were faithfully mistranslated into something much worse to Mr. Kuster, who, by the way, identified himself as the Dutch bat soldier in the blue helmet speaking to Mladic via interpreter uh, at transcript page 1229 to 1230 when shown this video. And by the way, his commander on the radio is Franken. And indeed, to demonstrate the veracity of Mr. Mladic's intent to engage in a humanitarian and voluntary evacuation, we see Mr. Mladic repeat to civilians that if they want to go, buses will be made available. Mr. Mladic is thanked and praised by the crowd of Bosnian Muslim civilians. Later on in the same video, he talks to another gathering of civilians, and that is in evidence too, explicitly telling them that those that want to stay and return to their homes may do so. So Mr. Mladic's words and deeds in Potachari, spoken in the same language as understood by the Bosnian Muslims, does not accord to the Dutch lower level officer's understanding of the same. Now, let's take a step further backward. From this appearance in Potocari, what has transpired prior to this appearance? Specifically, this is the evidence that the trial chamber disregarded that predates Mr. Mladic and the arrival of buses at Potocari. First, the highest leadership of the UN has determined evacuation is necessary for humanitarian reasons from Potocari. Appeal paragraph 578, citing General Cornelius Nikolai, citing Colonel Boring, the deputy commander of the Dutch battalion, and citing Mr. Kingery, the Kenyan UN officer in a blue helmet that we also saw in this same video. Second, Deputy Chief of Umfer Four, BH Command, Dutch General Cornelius Nicolai, has obtained the agreement of the Dutch Minister of Defense to issue an order to Colonel Karamans, the Dutch Battalion Commander in Srebrenica to obtain Mr. Mladic's help to ask for it for an urgent humanitarian evacuation from Potocari. Appeal, look at our appeal footnote 661. Again, this is before any of the meetings at the Hotel Fontana with Mr. Mladic. Third, 
at the first Fontana meeting, the video shows that Colonel Karamans expresses that the Bosnian Muslim civilian leadership has asked to leave and, co and conveys the UN, United Nations request for assistance in a humanitarian evacuation to Mr. Mladic. That's the video we just looked at, P1147, uh, and it's an appeal paragraph um, 578, footnote 663. This is confirmed by the prosecution military expert Butler. It's also confirmed by Karaman's own deputy commander, Boring, who was physically present and testified at trial that the UN did not have enough buses to do this evacuation on its own. You can find that in the appeal in footnotes 663 to 664. Indeed, Muslim civilian leaders had already ordered their own people to leave. Women and children and elderly to Potachari and fighters to Shushnadi. That's in evidence as P1547 and RM253 testified to it at transcript page 12516 to 12517. These high level UN meetings and discussions end up involving UMPA 4 Commander General Rupert Smith, Ambassador Yasushi Akashi, and Under Secretary General of the UN, Kofi Annan. Look at D1479. The United Nations asked for Mr. Mladic to help evacuate civilians out of Potichari. The chamber, finding him guilty of forcible transfer for the same act, would implicate the United Nations and is an unreasonable reading that selectively disregards the, message, the, the evidence. If you watch all three Hotel Fontana meetings in the video P1147, you will see Mr. Mladic welcoming, offering comforts to attendees, including cigarettes, beer, and sandwiches for lunch. This pattern of behavior is similarly demonstrated in the third Fontana meeting with Bosnian Muslim civilian attendees, including Mr. Mladic offering his own vehicle to safely escort a female participant, Chamila Omanovic, her daughter, grandchild, and mother during the evacuation. Again, prosecution expert Richard Butler could not identify anything criminal said in these meetings by Mr. Mladic. Ironically, and demonstrative of its error, the trial chamber actually disregarded its own finding, which accepted that during the Fontana meetings, Mr. Mladic offered civilians a choice to leave for Yugoslavia or the Federation or to stay in Republika Srpska. That is in judgment paragraph 2472 and is dealt with in appeal paragraph 579. Now, Let's return to Dutch Battalion Officer Franken, who is among the primary lower level officers selectively relied upon to convert this humanitarian evacuation into the crime of forcible transfer. The trial chamber focused on Franken to say, quote, that the transportation of Bosnian Muslims out of Potocari to Kladan was not a decision made by the Muslim delegation 
but rather, but rather ordered by Mladic. Paragraph 5004 of the judgment. It is puzzling and discernible error that the judgment disregarded this witness's own testimony to the contrary in violation of indubio pro reo. Indeed, Franken acknowledged that his commander, Colonel Karamans, ordered Franken to assist the VRS with the humanitarian evacuation, and that he later found General Smith that's Rupert Smith, and other high-ranking UN had asked Mr. Mladic for the evacuation and that separation of men was proper according to the laws of war to see if they were combatants. He testified to this in T10804 to 10807, 10817 to 10823, 10816, 10824 to 10825, and in his statement, D280. Now, most importantly, the trial chamber disregarded that Franken had not viewed the entire Hotel Fontania video before, of which we saw part of. That's at transcript page 10803, to 10807. Against this backdrop, it was error on the part of the trial chamber to rely selectively on other evidence of Franken, Kuster, and other lower level Dutch bat officers in light of the overwhelming evidence, even from Franken, and especially higher level. Dutch Bat and United Nations officials that demonstrate the United Nations, not Mr. Mladic, ordered this evacuation for humanitarian purposes and Mr. Mladic agreed with the UN to help. Now, the lack of Credibility as to Momer Nikolic will be discussed later as it pertains to killings. I think I mentioned that he was cited 35 times in these paragraphs. So there was no forcible transfer of Bosnian Muslims from Srebrenica, nor was there a common objective for the alleged JCE under a correct review of the above evidence and under the appropriate standard. The requisite elements of establishing the crime of forcible transfer must include expulsion or other forms of coercion as to carrying out forced displacement of persons. The forced character of the displacement is determined by the absence of a genuine choice by the victim in his <coughs> or her displacement. This is from the Colonel Yelitz Appeal Judgment, paragraph 229-233, and the Stockage Appeal Judgment, paragraph 279. Again, in all of this, it must be established with proper application <coughs> of in dubio pro reo, it is clear that in this judgment the trial chamber did not abide by this jurisprudence nor by this standard and thus committed discernible error in convicting Mr. Mladic of forcible transfer. Turning now to genocide, extermination, murders, and various other charges relating to the alleged executions of an undetermined number of men in Srebrenica. Let me at the outset make clear, as we have throughout the trial, that we do not dispute that in addition to legitimate combat casualties, 
some individuals, including individuals from the local area, the MOOP, and even Momir Nikolic, and other rogue members of the VRS security professional line of command, took it upon themselves to conduct acts of revenge and killings of prisoners of war, but did so during the time period when Mr. Mladic was not in the area. And contrary to any orders of Mr. Mladic or his knowledge at that time. I must stress that the VRS security line had its own parallel chain of command, separate and apart from the normal chain of command, such that it could exclude Mr. Mladic. Now, it must be stressed that the Krivaya 95 military operation was conceded to be a legitimate military operation due to the failure to demilitarize the Srebrenica, quote unquote, safe area. Prosecution can't fight that. Their own lead counsel for this uh, part of the case, Ms. Peter McCloskey, said that at transcript page 486. Their chief expert as to Srebrenica, Richard Butler, said that at transcript page 16498 to 16499. It must also be stressed that Directive 7.1 issued by Mr. Mladic replaced Directive 7 issued by President Karadzic and that both Directive 7.1 and the Krivaya 95 orders of the Drina Corps, by their wording, directed that civilians not be targeted and that the laws of war be followed, including the Geneva Conventions. Directive 7.1 is P1470, Krivaya 95 is D302. It must also be stressed that the column of men and boys set out from Srebrenica in combat formation and armed and engaged in ambushes, combat, suicides, infighting, minefields, and deaths in quote unquote kamikaze style attacks, end quote. Look to appeal paragraph 674 such that unfortunately we will never know the true number of actual legitimate casualties and those related to acts of the crime of murder. We must also at the outset repeat that the infamous Fontana Hotel meetings and the language used by Mr. Mladic has been declared legitimate military language, non-criminal, by Richard Butler at transcript page 16831. Thus, the chamber's conclusion that Krivaya 95 intended the cleansing of Muslims from Srebrenica is an impermissible inference, unsupported by the evidence. We have already discussed this error as to forcible transfer. In order to establish JCE liability of Mr. Mladic for the genocide and killings in Srebrenica, the evidentiary bar was supposed to be set at a high level. Per the jurisprudence, the standard of proof is beyond reasonable doubt, which, quote, presents a high hurdle for the prosecution to overcome, end quote. That's the Miltinovich Trial Judgment, Volume 1, Paragraph 62. 
As outlined by the Martich Appeals Chamber, it must meet more than a, quote, high degree of probability, end quote. That's paragraph 57. And of course, as set forth in the Celebici Appeals Judgment, it must be the only available conclusion under law and fact as existence of any alternative conclusion mandates acquittal. And that's at paragraph 45A. Additionally, since we are talking about genocide, the evidence must in accord with stated high standards, establish specific intent dolus specialis for genocide. And since it is a JCE, Mr. Mladic must be shown to have agreed to a common criminal purpose and significantly contributed to the same. Now, instances wherein the trial chamber erred in respect to applying the Jewish prudence to the facts are too numerous to go through. Allow me to simplify to the most essential. Per the prosecution and per the judgment, the JCE to kill and commit genocide did not even exist prior to the night between 11 and 12 July 1995. This is in the prosecution final trial brief at 1063. It's in the judgment at paragraph 4926, and it's discussed in our appeal at paragraph 586. Now, this is critical. As we have discussed before, under the jurisprudence, conduct and statements before the JCE and outside its temporal scope cannot be used to prove Mr. Mladic was part of that JCE. However, as the Srebrenica, the trial chamber does precisely erroneously rely on that type of evidence and so does the prosecution. Look at the prosecution response, paragraph 270 to 278, and the trial judgment at paragraph 2358 to 2362. And they also rely on circumstantial evidence and hearsay to attribute Mr. Mladic's agreement to a criminal plan requiring specific intent to commit genocide in addition to murder. For the convictions, impermissible inferences, and indeed, I will call them implied conclusions or implications, you'll see why in a second, are relied upon with no direct support as to Mr. Mladic, who, by the way, during this time period, the prosecution agrees was not in Srebrenica, but was far away in Belgrade when the killing started. Again, as to the Fontana meetings that are on video, both prosecution and defense military experts say the language used is appropriate as it is, as it is aimed at in the context of the armed 28th Bosnian Muslim Division still on the loose in the area of Srebrenica. Appeal paragraph 595. Without any direct orders, without any direct evidence linking Mr. Mladic to any killings, the trial chamber committed its gravest error. It created a legal fiction, a legal fiction that looks real from afar, but when you get closer, it becomes a mirage. This is a violation of the jurisprudence and discernible error. Now, I do not ask you to take my word for the approach of the trial chamber in this regard. Rather, 
I would invite you to listen along with me to an insider, the team leader and senior legal officer of the Mladic Trial Chamber, Jonas Nielsen, speaking publicly at the Asser Institute after the Mladic judgment. Let us see what secret evidence the trial chamber used in its approach to convict Mr. Mladic of the most serious crime of genocide. We have another video. I await instruction. Good evening to you all. My name is Christoph Barnes and I would like Sorry. to welcome you Excuse to the Oslo Institute and to this new Supranational Criminal Law Could you or SEL lecture. Could you tell me where in the record this video can be found? It's in the public record. It's in the public record in this case. No, it's in the public record, public domain, and it's germane to the way that the trial chamber dealt with the judgment. It's, it's talking about the judgment. Can I just have a moment, please, Your Honors? Okay, the, Your Honors, the prosecution is going to reserve our position on this video. We have no knowledge of what's in it. Okay. I will re rewind it so that we get the whole video. Thank you. The interpreters note that we do not have a transcript for this video to be able to interpret it into BCS. And without a transcript, I'm not sure that we can continue. Script in English that was provided uh, list, uh, in English, two pages. There were only two videos, and this was the second one. Does that assist? It should be labeled at the top. We do have video one. I'm not sure we have video two. It's labeled Astra Institute to Jonas Nielsen video. I have a copy if it can be provided that might assist. I don't have my head for me. Yes, thank you. That would assist. And I apologize if I, if I missed something because I didn't have my headset in. So I'll wait for the uh, document to be given to the booth and then I will put, put the video on. So please give an indication when you are ready. Okay, I have been told that they have it. I will now try again. Good evening to you all. My name is Christoph Barnes, and I would like to welcome you to the Oslo Institute and to this new Supranational Criminal Law, or SEL Lecture. Now, the SEL Lecture Series is a series on international criminal law and has been organized since 2003 by the Oslo Institute in cooperation with the Coalition for the ICC and the Grote Center for International Legal Studies at Leiden University. On the 22nd of November 2017, the International Criminal Tribunal for the Former Yugoslavia, or ICTY, rendered judgment in its final trial in the case of Prosecutor versus Radko Mladic. After more than five years of trial, the rendering of the judgment marked the end, not only of the proceedings in this case, but also of the work of the ICTY. As one of the biggest war crimes trials in history, it presents numerous challenges and lessons that are relevant for other present and future international courts and tribunals. And because of this, I'm very happy that we have an excellent speaker uh, for you tonight, who is in the unique position to give an insider's view of these challenges and lessons. Uh, Jonas Nielsen, he has worked at the ICTY between 2005 and 2017 as a senior legal officer and legal officer. 
and during the last years he was the team leader in trial chamber one assigned to the Mladic case. The first question was who ordered the killings in Srebrenica. There is an interesting passage in the judgment about when more or less, now I can't remember the dates in my head, but there is during a certain night when men and boys are being captured and detained and held and there is discussions between the military leadership and Mladic is around and you can, there is no, there's no meeting, there's no order, written order, there's no meeting where we have minutes where it says where this is set out. But the trial chamber looked at various indications, what was said on a certain day and what was said in the evening, what was discussed with various people and then suddenly what was discussed the day after and what in particular what some witnesses, some insiders did testify, what they were indicating and it was possible to somehow pinpoint more or less, not by the hour, but which night this decision must have been taken when it was, when the decision was taken that from deporting or capturing or whatever these men and the decision was taken to that they should be killed. Now I don't know exactly who did it, but there is an implication that this is a, the whole military leadership was, the high military leadership of Bosnia Serb Republic was involved at the time and Mladic was present around this time as well in Srebrenica, certainly the implication that he must have been involved in taking the decision. I don't think there is a finding on this particular and it didn't really have to be a finding on it in the context of the Joint Criminal Enterprise. Had it been, had it only been charged with ordering, ordering, then it would be not necessary to go that far and maybe it's not possible to go that far because again, no, there's no written order, there's no meeting minutes or anything like that. It's somehow what you can understand from the change of attitude by people, the high military leaders who were involved and someone who then stepped forward and testified in the case. So the reason I show this is to show that the trial chamber. The council is just asked to pause a little bit until the interpretation into BCS is finished. Thank you very much. So the reason I showed this is because it demonstrates that the trial chamber created a legal fiction, including participation in a meeting that they don't know who was there, if it took place at all, they don't know where, but they convict Mr. Mladic merely by implication for genocide, the highest crime of all. There's an admission of no orders. In fact, no particular finding as to Mr. Mladic's participation, nor acceptance of this illusory, illusory meeting's conclusion to commit genocide. Nothing. Mr. Nielsen stuttering on possibilities and implications based on nothingness. No application of indubio pro reo or any of the relevant jurisprudence. And to reach a conviction as to Mr. Mladic, they have to interpret changed behaviors 
in persons other than Mr. Mladic and key insider witnesses who testified. I submit the conviction of Mr. Mladic for genocide was made out of thin air. But let's look at who the, who the uh, key insider witness relied upon by the chamber for this infamous meeting that again, they cannot prove. Mr. Nielsen doesn't say. Per the judgment, this insider is Momir Nikolic. Appeal, footnote, 678. Judgment, paragraphs, 4926 to 4927. 4970. 5096 to 5097. 5128. Even worse, it is not Momer Nikolic himself, but primarily hearsay evidence, including hearsay notes of an interview taken by OTP investigator Bruce Bursick for purposes of litigation that is among the main sources cited, and that's D1228. Please take note that D1228 was not presented for the truth of the matters asserted in it and was only presented to Mr. Nikolic for the, by the prosecution to confirm a hand gesture from a purported meeting with Mr. Mladic. The trial chamber rejected that as being unreliable evidence. That's in the judgment paragraph 5127. In fact, D1228 was only used in cross-examination of witness Bursic to establish that Nikolic lacked credibility and was evasive and that the prosecution violated its own rules by not filming the critical interviews where he alleged to implicate Mr. Mladic. More importantly, Mr. Bursic could not corroborate Nikolic as to any encounter with Mr. Mladic. That is in our appeal, paragraph 588-592. D1228 could not be relied upon as the truth of the hearsay comments of Mr. Nikolic as it would be in violation of the Lex Specialis of then rules 92 bis and tour. We have this, the jurisprudence listed in footnote 691 of our appeal. Now, Momir Nikolic is someone who appears everywhere, everywhere that there are killings, either directing them or as an accomplice. He admitted to hiding the burial operation from superiors, including the VRS main staff. That's uh, in D301, page 7, and during his testimony at T11965 to T11966. The trial chamber further erred in relying upon Mr. Nikolic despite another prosecution insider witness, RM265, who testified as to opportunistic revenge killings that they witnessed in the presence of Momir Nikolic, and that prisoners of war taken to schools in Zvornik were undertaken under the orders of Momir Nikolic and Nikolic's superior within the security chain of command in the brigade, Lieutenant Colonel Popovich. That is at P2450 and P2451. RM265 did not implicate Mladic in any of Nikolic or Popovich's illegal and criminal activities. It is all the more interesting 
that Momir Nikolic's security chain of command superior is implicated, that is to say Popovich, by another prosecution insider witness from the VRS, a high-ranking officer, RM376, who also does not implicate Mr. Mladic in any of the events relating to revenge or killings, but does identify that the very same Popovich of the security chain of command asked for volunteers outside the army, i.e. civilians, to execute Muslim prisoners, which this VRS officer refused. That's at um, P1594, page 31 to 42, and in the public transcript, 2794 to 2796. Now, this all begs the question, if General Ratko Mladic, commander of the main staff of the VRS Army, had hypothetically, or to use Mr. Nielsen's term, implicitly agreed to significantly contribute to genocide, why would security officers al aligned with Momar Nikolic not even in the direct chain of command to Mladic, be in charge of this, and why would they be asking for non-army volunteers to do the killing? While actual VRS officers and subordinates under Mladic refused such requests and never received them from Mr. Mladic through the normal chain of command. I think you will agree this demonstrates an error in the trial chamber's implied reasoning linking Mr. Mladic to these crimes. Momir Nikolic pled guilty to try to get a better deal for himself, despite having his arms soaked in blood. Further, Nikolic confirmed he destroyed documentary evidence which could have compromised him in relation to Srebrenica crimes. That's D301, page 7. But guess what? Coming back to this illusory meeting, even Momir Nikolic cannot be relied upon by the chamber as to this illusory meeting because even he does not have direct evidence about it. See the judgment at paragraph 4953, see the appeal at paragraph 587. So to what imaginary insider VRS witness testimony linking Mr. Mladic to this supposed meeting is Mr. Nielsen referring to upon which the trial chamber relied? The defense submits no one. No fewer than five insider witnesses, three defense, two prosecution, gave direct evidence that the only meeting during this critical time period was related to Zepa and contained only legitimate military instructions. Look to appeal paragraph 594. By disregarding this evidence in favor of impermissible hearsay of Momer Nikolic, the trial chamber erred. This is particularly true given the jurisprudence that accomplice evidence is to be treated with caution. The Satako Appeals Chamber highlighted such concerns that no accomplice witness pardon me, that accomplice witnesses may have motives or incentives to implicate the accused person before the tribunal or to lie. Uh, Satako Appeal Judgment, paragraph 143. This Satako Appeals Judgment requires a chamber to be bound 
to carefully consider the totality of the circumstances in which such accessory evidence is given. With all due respect, in the instant case, as to Momir Niklic, the trial chamber erred, and in doing so, tried to make Niklic the illusory link of, to Mr. Mladic with the JCE that could not be proven in accord with the prevailing legal jurisprudence and thus resorted to the legal fiction of guilt by implication. Now, we've already talked about Fontana, I'm not gonna, uh, and Potachari and all the words of Mr. Mladic there. I'm gonna talk about the other evidence, again, by several prosecution and defense witnesses that Mr. Mladic made similarly non-criminal statements to captured or surrendered members of the 28th Division's column where he tells them they will be fed and then transported and exchange with the other side's forces. We have RM292 at transcript page 12659 and 12662. We have RM253 at transcript page 12532. We have RM364 at P118. Witness Jovic, Jovcic, D976. Paragraph 9, witness Boyan Subotic, transcript page 32826. And this evidence also shows us that Mr. Mladic's direct orders to subordinates were consistent with protecting these prisoners during transport and medical aid and water was provided to them in accord with these orders. Boyan Subotic, transcript page 32826 to 32827, and D926, paragraph 30 to 34. Can such action be considered a significant contribution to the implied JCE that the trial chamber concluded, or does indubio pro reo indicate otherwise? Alibi. Again, while Mr. Mladic is far from Srebrenica attending to a secret peace meeting with the international community, in Belgrade in a wedding and at a hospital, he could not have effective control nor information from Bosnia and Herzegovina, let alone exercise command. Again, his absence was not contested by the prosecution at trial. Appeal paragraph 605. The failure of the trial chamber to give a reasoned opinion as to four routine orders issued in this time by others under Mr. Mladic's name is set forth in paragraph 610 to 612 of our appeal, including errors as to an inference that Mr. Mladic personally signed said orders from another country and failure to analyze and give weight to their content because none of them related to Srebrenica and each had log entries showing they did not come from Mladic's office, appeal paragraph 611. The trial chamber's conclusion that Mr. Mladic issued the orders and was in command and control while he was physically and geographically absent from Srebrenica in another country is contrary to evidence and is therefore demonstrable error. It disregarded and contradicted itself in, in the judgment in paragraph 4299 that, quote, in Mladic's absence, reports were to be submitted to Milovanovic, end quote. Now, Milovanovic and other Military witnesses confirmed that during this time period when Modric was gone in July of 1995, Milovanovic was in charge. Stavanovic at transcript page 35265 and Milovanovic himself at transcript page 11751.
one and one six nine five zero. Furthermore, in paragraph six oh five of the appeal, strike that I'm going to move on. In paragraph six oh five of the appeal, we talk about the meeting that Mr. Mladic attended where a plan was signed to allow the Red Cross access to Srebrenica POWs and that they were to be exchanged, quote, all for all, end quote, with the other side for Serb detainees. Also, a lasting and permanent ceasefire was negotiated to try to end the war. No reasonable trier of fact could conclude Mr. Mladic could engage in complex peace negotiations with high officials in Dobinovci, again, UN officials, while exercising effective control in Srebrenica. Such conduct, agreeing to allow access uh, uh, to the Red Cross of Srebrenica POWs before exchanging them, cannot be used to support knowledge of nor a purported contribution to any JCE to exterminate, let alone commit genocide against these same persons. Moving along, I'm almost done. My colleague has given you the law on adjudicated facts. We recognize that any illegal killings in Srebrenica that were outside of combat are reprehensible but they are not tied to Mr. Mladic. And the trial chamber erred in not performing any analysis to determine which were victims of murder and which were deaths resulting from alternate legitimate reasons. The trial chamber relied upon adjudicated facts to establish all were victims of crimes and all were civilians. Judgment paragraph 3062, 3546, discussed in our appeal at paragraph 669 to 672. In doing so, the trial chamber disregarded its own finding that the armed elements of the column of men had casualties. This is discussed in appeal Paragraph 671, judgment paragraphs 2395, 2444, 2446, 2573 to 2586, 2515 to 2645. The trial chamber further disregarded the prosecution's own demography expert whose evidence in indicated that 70% of the victims were registered as soldiers of the Armia BIH. That's in appeal paragraph 671. It also disregarded evidence rebutting the adjudicated fact and showing that bodies in the mass graves came from different events in different years and included legitimate casualties of combat, suicides, minefields, etc appeal paragraph 674, and that both defense and prosecution, forensic experts relating to the alleged blindfolds said they could have been bandanas that dropped over the eyes as bodies decayed. Bandanas as seen in the footage of the Armia BIH fighters that arrived in Tuzla from Srebrenica. Appeal paragraph 674 and D 340. The lack of analysis of the trial chamber thus failed to establish the number of victims and their relation to any crime, let alone genocide. In this regard, I would be remiss if I did not point out referencing ground eight and paragraph 787 and 793 of our appeal that one of the final witnesses, which the trial chamber erroneously did not allow the defense to call, was a member of the Srebrenica column, 
And since trial, they have died and become deceased, thus increasing the gravity of this refusal and this error. When everything is taken together, we believe the er errors are very clear and ground eight must be granted and an acquittal issued as to Mr. Modic. Your honors, at this stage, that is about all that either myself or my colleague, Ms. Bagot, can do. We, under these circumstances, would refer you to our written submissions um, as we have no, more, no further oral submissions given our inability to meaningfully seek instruction from our client. And I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lukic. And I think this will be a suitable time to pause for an hour. All rise. All rise. We will agree. Thank you. <clears throat> No, we should I think we are one hour behind. <laughs>